when I was seven. Our next door neighbor came pounding on our front door to scream at and threaten to kill my dad because our pet that we kept in our backyard was being too loud. The pet was a rabbit. It's a rabbit. So my upstairs neighbor is soft-spoken, heavy-footed, and rarely leaves her apartment except to take out the trash. The stairs are a challenge for her. My boyfriend and I question her decision to live on the second floor. That being said, besides the creaking floorboards in the middle of the night, we have had zero negative encounters with her in the two years we've lived here. If you don't count the awkward staring we get from her as negative, I guess. She often leaves her door open, so I gather she's a religious person from the gospel to listens to. I've not had the pleasure of seeing the inside of her apartment, but I'm willing to bet the Bible has a special place on her coffee table. Today, as I was coming back from taking out the trash, I noticed a handwritten note taped to my door. At first glance, I assumed a child had written it, but the context threw me a bit. It reads, poor grammar and all. I was called to do a assignment to gather the townspeople for a public reading. Men, women, child, elder by the Most High. I didn't see any notes on any of the other doors as I was coming back from taking out the trash, so I was confused, to say the least, as to why the hell this was on my door. I walked upstairs to ask my neighbor if she had gotten the same note. I stopped halfway up the stairs and knocked on the wall because her door was wide open as usual. As she approached I saw she was holding a clipboard and pen. The cog started turning so I asked if she had written the note. With a blankness in her eyes she shook her head yes. In an attempt to be as polite as possible I asked her where the public reading would be held. She stared down silently at the note in my hand for a gut-wrenching fifteen seconds. I felt my heart drop to my stomach, but kept a smile. Finally, she replied in a whisper, I don't know. At this point, I am thoroughly shook. In the sweetest tone possible, I said okay and started to walk back downstairs. With my back turned, I heard her add, When it is time, you will know I'm sure. My heart was racing as I went back into my apartment and locked all the doors. Why I locked the doors I have no idea. Her words made me feel unsafe. I called the main office of the complex to explain what just happened and was informed that multiple residents had made the same confused call. The landlady asked our neighbor the same question I did and received a similar ambiguous answer. My boyfriend thinks she is losing her wits due to her sedentary, solitary lifestyle, and that might be true. All I know for sure is that we are currently living beneath a woman who barely speaks and believes she has been chosen by her God to do a public reading that he, she, they, it has not yet determined a date for. I'm feeling away, probably more than I have a right to feel about this for someone who doesn't have all the facts. Has anyone here had any similar encounters? What was the outcome? If the date and place is set, do you think I should go? Update. This morning I heard a crash outside my door. From past experience, I could pretty safely assume that she was throwing her trash bag down the stairs as she does to save effort. But considering our talk yesterday, I decided to look through the peephole just to be sure she didn't fall down or anything. I was right, no alarm to be had. But I let curiosity get the best of me and couldn't take my eyes away from the door. After she cleaned up any mess she made, she sat down on the bottom step to catch her breath. I realized at this point that if I back away now she will hear the creaky floor and know I was watching. I was stuck. I could stand there for some indefinable amount of time until she gets up and leaves or I could open the door to have another conversation. The second I opened the door she apologized for the noise. I told her no worries and that I was only concerned she may have slipped and fell. As I was closing the door she apologized again, this time for our conversation yesterday. I said she had nothing to be sorry for. Again she apologized and tapped her temple as if to say, this brain's not what it used to be. Let me reiterate that she is not an elderly person. With all that said, as soon as I know she's not within earshot, I'm going to be making a wellness check call. Thank you all for your input, concern, and advice. Much appreciation. I dealt with a stalker a little over four years ago. It was a terrible experience and last I heard that guy was living in another state. But for the past few weeks I have discovered a man lurking around my house in the middle of the night, and I just saw him again tonight. I don't know if it my old stalker or someone new. 
For a few weeks I have heard small noises while smoking outside at night, like rustling bushes or car creaking or a small scrape on the pavement. It scared me, but I tried convincing myself it was just a cat and that I'm being paranoid. I rarely go outside by myself anymore, and if I do, I bring a big knife with me. I have a baby daughter now and am not about to let anyone get in my house. A few weeks ago a cigarette disappeared from my ashtray outside, and it wasn't windy or anything. The next night I saw a silhouette walking up the street, and when it got to the bushes at the end of my driveway, it didn't emerge from the other side. Through the bushes I could see what looked like a man's silhouette crouching, and I ran inside scared as hell. I told my fiancé immediately, he went outside to look and didn't find anyone. He said it was most likely a nosy neighbor and for me to not worry. Needless to say, I put more locks on my baby's window and door than a maximum security prison. Tonight, I really needed a cigarette and my fiancé was asleep so I got my trusty knife and braved it. I heard the car clicking and thought maybe the cat jumped on it. The cat ended up being inside. I kept my knife ready and stared at the car for what felt like a long time because I was too afraid to move. That's when I saw the outline of a head through the rear window pop up from behind the car and quickly duck back down. I about had a heart attack. I sprinted inside, and I heard a foot scrape on the driveway, as if the man were either running away or towards me. I didn't take the time to look back, just ran inside and locked the door and turned the lights off. It's 3 a.m. now and I'm too afraid to sleep. I've contemplated calling the police, no matter how much I hate them, but I'm sure they won't do anything to help as I have no evidence. In a way I'm hoping it is just some random creep or nosy person, because if it is my old stalker that could end up being very bad. I don't know what to do here. I'm not sure who it is, I'm too afraid to do anything but run away, we're too poor to move, and I'm terrified of something happening to my daughter. Any advice would surely help. So this took place some years ago, but it still creeps me out to this day. I was staying with my then boyfriend at his apartment on the lower level. He had what seemed like a really cool neighbor. We will call him Dan. Well, Dan was a heavyset middle-aged man around 40, white, and didn't have any kids or a wife, etc. He liked younger girls, though, and he liked to pay them for their services, you know, the ones similar to Backpage, but only post-Backpage days. So my boyfriend one day decided to joke with him and said, well, if you like to pay, how about my girlfriend shows you her boobs and you pay both of us? As he laughed it off because he could feel my piercing stare directed straight through him as if to say, yeah, you've lost your damn mind. My boyfriend knows I'm not that type of girl and never have been, so I'm guessing that was what made it all the more funny to him. But anyways, one night, Dan asked my boyfriend to take him to the store for beer, and he did. Well, at the store, there was a clerk. She was a pretty little petite, blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl, around 22 years old, that Dan liked but was too shy to approach. So my boyfriend, trying to be a wingman or something for Dan, was able to get her number for him. Well, a week or so goes by, and Dan comes and knocks on the door and tells my boyfriend that the clerk will call her April agreed to come over and hang out with him once she got off work. Dan didn't have a car, and neither did she, so he paid my boyfriend gas money to take him to the store to pick her up. We all rode to go pick April up, and she came over, and we were all talking and drinking until they decided to retreat upstairs to Dan's apartment. She stayed overnight with him and left the next morning, so I'm assuming she rendered him some services that night because the following morning Dan was super happy and telling my boyfriend about how he enjoyed her company the night before. Well, this goes on for about three weekends, and let me say this. From my interactions with April, I could tell she had some sort of habit drug, alcohol because she would appear inebriated every time I'd seen her. And not that I'm judging because I'm not, and I kind of didn't blame her. She was doing the shit strictly for the money and no pleasure. Dan was way out of her league, and he knew it. And she wasn't sexually attracted to him, so she felt she had to be high or drunk after to screw him. Dan seemed really nice but he just had something strange about him that I couldn't pinpoint exactly. Well, it started to get old to April to the point Dan had to beg like hell and offer more money for her time. So she agreed to another nightly tryst, but it would end differently this time, and April had no clue what was to come. We picked her up as usual, and they went straight to his apartment. 
A couple of hours go by, and we can hear knocking and banging upstairs, you know, like the sounds of people having hard sex. My boyfriend proceeds to comment, Damn, he's F-seeking the shit out of her. Then we hear running and loud stomps back and forth on the floor upstairs. Not knowing what the hell is going on, we hear Dan yelling, One, two, three, counting. At this point, it was really starting to piss me off to where I was going to tell my boyfriend to go knock on the damn door and tell them we're trying to sleep. But then, a moment later, all was silent. We fell asleep only to be woken up by siren lights. We were oblivious to what was going on, and it was late, so we went back to sleep. So the next morning, we found out Dan was taken to jail for the murder of April. Come to find out that strange thing I couldn't quite pinpoint that was weird about him was his sadistic fetishes. That night, Dan had tied April up with a cord, binding her feet and hands together, and putting a collar or some sort around her neck as well to choke her and restrict her air supply. He left out of the room for some reason, leaving her to suffocate to death. The sounds of counting we heard were him trying to do CPR on her lifeless body. My boyfriend believed it was an accident simply because he felt Dan was a nice guy and didn't seem like the type to do something like that, but I beg to differ. I feel he was falling in love or obsessed with her and knew he couldn't have her, so he wanted no one else to be able to either. It just goes to show behind smiling faces they can mask pure evil. Dan will never see daylight to be able to do this to another woman again. Sometimes I think if only my boyfriend would have never gotten her number for Dan, she'd still be alive today. But then I think no, it would then only have happened to another woman instead. So this happened a few months ago and still genuinely freaks me out. So my work involves proving an in-home service, so a lot of my day is driving to my clients' homes. I have one client that lives about 30 minutes from me in a very rural area. Anyway, I left my house at around 11 a.m. to get to this client. At a stoplight about 5 minutes from my house, which is in the middle of a heavily trafficked city, the car in front of me turned their left turn signal on, so naturally when the light turned green I drove around them. After I passed them, I noticed that the turn signal was turned off, and, and instead they went straight and were now behind me. Thought nothing of this at the time because who doesn't get confused about directions sometimes. So I keep driving down these backcountry rides that are not heavily trafficked and the car continues to follow. After about 20 minutes I started to get more aware while this car could very simply be going in the same direction as me. I just found it a little off their route was matching mine exactly. When I finally got to my client's house and made the turn into the driveway, I fully expected the car to keep driving. But nope, they turn into the driveway behind me as well. The driveway was narrow, thus they were essentially now blocking me in. I turned my car off and waited a few minutes, and the car behind me stayed on and didn't move. The windows were tinted so I couldn't see inside. I sat in the car waiting, and the person in the car behind me didn't get out. They just continued to sit there, car running. I called my client and asked if she could come stand on the porch so I could get out of my car and she happily obliged. The minute my client stepped out on the porch, the car very quickly backed out and drove away. The client did not recognize the car. I have no idea why it happened. I didn't do anything to cause any sort of road rage, so why this car suddenly started following me is very bizarre. And if was something sinister, why do it midday? Anyway, it's just been on my mind for a while and thought I'd share. I really have no explanation for what happened, which is probably the most frustrating part. I was in my early 20s and living at home while attending graduate school. I was dropped off home at night after a date with the man who later became my husband only good part of the story. My parents were in the living room with my older brother Eric and I went upstairs to hang out with my two younger sisters, Sarah and Laura, in the room they shared. The three of us, I'm sure, were talking about my date and other sister gossip, when suddenly there was a thump-like noise at the window. Sarah and I heard the noise but didn't really pay attention to it, but Laura was closer to the window and walked up to it and opened the blinds. Suddenly she screamed, and when Sarah looked at her in the window, we saw why. Staring back at us through the window was a man's face on the second floor of the house no less. Seeing this man, Sarah and I both screamed as well, and the three of us ran out of the room and sprinted downstairs, screaming there was a man in our window. 
My dad immediately ran outside alone since my brother Eric had some leg injury and was in a brace or cast and was unable to join him. After a few minutes my dad came back in and told us he didn't see the man or anyone at all, but there was a ladder laying on its side right under my sister's bedroom window. My dad called the police who came pretty quickly and searched the area themselves. They didn't find much, though they did notice footprints leading into woods behind our backyard. Unfortunately, they really couldn't do anything else to find him, though they did patrol the area for a while. Since it all happened so fast and the three of us ran out of the room right away, we didn't get any sort of good look at the man, not to mention it was dark out. Thankfully, though, we never saw him again. However, about 15 years later, I was now married and had three kids and lived in a house not even 10 minutes away from that house I grew up in. I worked as nurse in a hospital, and one day there was a horrible snowstorm. The roads were awful and cars were snowed in. Me and a co-worker didn't feel safe driving, so we got a ride with another co-worker, whose husband was picking her up and had a nice van that was better to drive in snow. Not far from my first co-worker's house, we saw an older man, looking like he was in his late 60s, walking alone. Our driver pulled up and asked if he was okay and the man said his car was stuck or something in the snow, so he just decided to walk home since it was just about a mile away, if that. We nicely offered him a ride since it was so close, which he accepted. When asked where he lived, it ended up being the very same street I grew up on, a bit of a ways down the road since it was a long road, but still effectively neighbors. I commented this, saying how I grew up there and my parents sold the house a few years earlier, he asked which house exactly, and I told him. He looked at me and said, You lived at XXXX? Wasn't that the house that had a man looking in the window? Taken aback, I said it was. He replied, Oh yes. I remember reading about it in the newspaper. It was never in the newspaper. I already knew that, but I even checked with my parents later that evening to be sure. The man looking in our window was never in the newspaper or on the news. My feeling is this man was the peeping Tom. The man we were giving a ride home was the same man who I saw staring into our window 15 years before. Now, obviously that could be considered quite the leap to make, but hear me out. First of all, it wasn't in the newspaper. That was simply not true. While it's possible this man simply misremembered how he heard about the story and assumed it was in the paper, I don't buy that. While it was extremely creepy and memorable to me and my family, was it really that memorable for a neighbor quite a few houses down to have it be the first thing he recalled about the house 15 years later? I don't think so. There wasn't any yelling or screaming outside of the house. There was no noise like a gunshot or fighting. Nobody was hurt. Nobody was arrested or even accused. The only thing that would potentially be memorable for a neighbor was the police being called. And even then, all they did was walk around. They didn't chase after the man or bang down a door. And again, this man in the car didn't even live next door. From his house, maybe he'd see flashing lights, but that's really it. So yeah, I'm 100% convinced this man was the same man in our window all those years ago. I think me saying that's where I lived at the time gave him some sick pleasure, remembering what he did and wanted to see my reaction. Thankfully, I didn't have much of one in the moment since I was so surprised he brought it up. After he said he read it in the newspaper, my only response was saying something like, oh really, and that was it. A minute or two later we thankfully reached his house, and that was the last time I ever saw him. I wish I could I say I confronted him on the story not being in the paper and pressed him, but I didn't. The thoughts I now have obviously didn't come to me in the very short time we were together in that car. But after thinking about it later and talking to my parents, I was convinced. I asked my dad if he knew the guy at all, and all he knew was the guy's name and he was married, at least at the time when we lived on that street. Obviously we couldn't exactly do anything about it, though my dad and brother would say they'd like to go confront him about it. Now all these years later, it's something my siblings and I will occasionally talk about and even laugh about a little bit, like teasing my brother about being unable to go look for him. Though it doesn't change the fact that it was a genuinely terrifying night. My sister Laura, who opened the blinds and was essentially face to face with him, still to this day pins her curtains shut at night and keeps her blinds closed at night and refuses to look out of the window when it's late at night. And even writing this over 35 years later gives later gives me a bit of a chill, 
especially talking to the man in the car 15 years later. If I'm right and he was the creep, how often did he watch us through the window? Was the only time or just the final time? I won't say I'm happy he's no longer alive since as sure as I am, I can't really know it was him for a fact. But I certainly don't feel sad about it either. I'm still pretty jarred from this experience, but I figured it would be easier to share about it than keep dwelling on this. A couple days ago, someone broke into my house while I was asleep. I work night shifts so sleeping during the day is something you learn to get used to. Around 6.30 p.m. I heard what I thought was a loud knocking sound coming from outside and my dogs going absolutely ballistic. For reference, I live on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. My closest neighbor is a half mile away. But back to the story. So somewhat wake up, but don't really think anything of it since my neighbors like to shoot their guns, and this was during hunting season. As I start falling back asleep, my heart started fluttering weird like I knew something wasn't right. That's when I heard loud footsteps throughout the house. The dogs are still barking but start to quiet down. That's when I really begin to worry. When I think my dogs would protect me in a time like this, fat chance. The footsteps stop on the other side of my bedroom door and doesn't move. I think this is how I'm going to die and although I had a weapon in my room, I knew I couldn't get it without being heard. It felt like an eternity before the steps moved around and towards my brother's room. Rustling can heard loudly through the house and things being thrown. I knew they were in my brother's room. Some of his friends are into seedy situations and I knew it had to be one of them. So I heard the footsteps coming back to my door and the doorknob handle moves. I immediately turn my back towards the door and close my eyes tight, a hand over my mouth to stop from screaming. The door opens but that's it. Then he leaves as a car drives down the road. I finally bucked up my courage and get out of bed. Everything in the house except for my brother's room was undisturbed. I immediately called my brother and asked if any of his friends were coming over. He said not that he knew of and I told him what happened. He got off the phone with me to start calling around. I went back to bed and noticed that I still had my window cracked over from earlier and realized I had my sheet off of me wearing only a t-shirt to bed if it was who I think it was. This wasn't a random event. One of my brother's friends has always had eyes for me, and the fact that he saw me sleeping and in just a t-shirt makes me freak out. Whether or not he took something out of my brother's room or knew I was home alone sleeping before having to work later that night, I don't know. I'll post an update when I hear from my brother. You move out to the country to get away from the activity of city life and let your guard down. That's when something like this happens. Sometimes country life isn't so safe after all. Update. Sorry y'all for the late update. It's been a crazy week. But thank you for bearing with me. My brother got back with me with news I absolutely dreaded hearing. None of his friends said or claimed to have been at the house at the time of the incident. So now I'm even more afraid of who was at my home and what their intentions were. They could have been scoping out my house during the day now that my county has decided to extend the gravel on my road that connects to the farming community I live near. I just hope I don't have another visit like that anytime soon. But if there is a next time, I'll be sure to ready for them. When I was in fifth grade, my family and I went to New Mexico a lot because we were born there. I really liked spending time with my two cousins, Tony and Paul. When we were at their little house in Posos, we would play soccer in their backyard or watch TV. When we weren't doing that, we'd be playing with our Legos, trying to see who could build the weirdest structure. One day, we were playing a game we made up called Pine Cone Wars. Then the neighbor and some of his family came out of their house. Their house was right next to Tony and Paul's place. I think the neighbor's sister was talking with my mom. All of a sudden, the boy from the neighbor's house walked up to us and said hi to Tony and Paul. Paul introduced my brother and me to him. Let's call the boy Owen. We shook hands and right away my hands started feeling tingly. I found it strange. I think Owen was two years older than me. We played pine cone wars until my grandma called my brother and me for dinner. So, oh, by the way, the rest of my family was there too. After eating, I went to the couch and played Legend of Zelda on my Game Boy Color. Because my grandma's neighborhood was pretty safe, she didn't have an alarm system. That might explain what happened next. 
My brother and I had to go to bed, so I slept in the guest room. I left my Game Boy on the couch. Suddenly, I heard the door opening quietly. It felt like my heart stopped for a moment. I lay there frozen for a minute until I finally pulled the blanket over my head. I heard heavy breathing at the side of my bed, and I put my hands around my nose and mouth to cover my breathing. Then I heard footsteps leave my room and I couldn't sleep at all that night. The next day I found a note on the floor. The note said, Hi Lily, good luck sleeping tonight. Next to the note was a freshly cut rabbit's paw. I screamed so loud that the neighbors probably heard. My mom rushed into the room and saw the note in Rabbit's paw. Her face turned pale, and it looked like she wanted to throw up. After a while, my grandma came in too. She got a pair of gloves from the garage and used them to throw out the Rabbit paw. I didn't feel like eating after that, and I didn't eat the whole day. Also, I never found the Game Boy after that. I didn't feel safe there at night anymore, so I asked my family to lock the doors this time. But in the middle of the next night, I heard a knock at the window. My bed was right next to the window, so I had no choice but to look out. When I did, I saw Owen standing there, giving me this really big and kind of creepy smile. It made me feel uneasy like something wasn't right. I didn't know what to do at that time. And then I saw him trying to open my window. He noticed it was locked and went away, but I was still too scared to go to sleep. Four years later, I heard the news that Owen is in prison now for doing something very bad to a teenage girl. Whenever I remembered what happened that night, I thought about how close I might have been to being his victim. For context, I live in a subsidized housing complex for people with disabilities. With the exception of one guy with cerebral palsy, everyone here has something psychological going on. For the most part, things are pretty quiet. Us mentally ill types having too much going on in our own brains to really bother anyone else, and we tend to keep to ourselves unless there's a holiday party in the common room. I've been here about five years now, and I'm not sure I've even met everyone. It's a couple of odd things that do go on. There's one lady who wears long sleeves even in the middle of summer because she thinks spiders will come after her, will wander the halls knocking on doors asking if people can spare any tobacco or papers. Not in itself too odd, except that she bangs on the doors really loudly and yell through the door you got any papers? At two in the morning. She doesn't bother me since I don't smoke, but she often goes to the guy next door, and her voice carries all down the hall. Now the guy next door. Generally a pretty quiet fellow, but when I first moved in I felt a bit uneasy because a couple of times, there was a guy outside his window yelling that he wasn't going to go away until he let him in. Have no idea what that was about, but I haven't seen or heard him in a couple years, so I guess they sorted out whatever it was he was after. But a few months ago, I heard some yelling outside my door and a woman screaming, No, neighbor, stop. When I looked out my peephole, I saw his caseworker walking away comforting an upset-looking older woman. It's not old enough to be his mom, maybe a sister. Haven't heard a peep from him since. There's a guy down the hall who moved in a few months after me. One time at night I heard banging and just figured it was the guy next door hanging up pictures or something. Later I was walking down the hall and the floor was littered with bits of particle board-like material. He'd taken a hammer or something to his door and busted a big hole in it. A couple weeks or months later, my girlfriend and I saw him outside swinging around what looked like a golf club with the club part broken off. We called his caseworker, she called the cops, and he spent a couple days in the hospital. He's been pretty quiet since then. Then there's the guy on the top floor, he's a real oddball. Wears a baseball helmet pretty much all the time, really ratty clothes, some of them repaired with duct tape. One time at a party he was talking about how he died once and talked with the devil. She's one of the people Spider Lady asks for tobacco. Not long after I moved in I saw him outside the store, doubled over with cops asking if he was okay and on any medication. I wished I could have helped but at that point I didn't even know his name and figured I would have just been in the way if I'd tried, so I kept on walking. His mom used to bring him meals every week or so, but she passed away recently. I feel sorry for the guy, he's got a lot to deal with. Other than that, things are pretty tame here. They're a very quiet woman with Tourette's down the hall. She smiles at me when I greet her in the hallway, but rarely talks. 
A guy on the top floor plays accordion and you can hear him practicing when you walk down that hall. The guy directly across the hall from me has schizophrenia. He comes over every couple weeks to share a meal or a drink with me. Very mild-mannered man. Seems a lot older than he is. I would have guessed 50s, turns out he isn't even 40 yet. He's actually pretty intelligent, but you have to talk to him a while before you realize that. He seems heavily sedated and talks about very mundane stuff like new clothing or his daily 30-min walks, often repeating the same topics over multiple visits, but every now and then you can get a real intellectual conversation about science out of him. And there's a guy around the corner who's really friendly when we meet outside the building that likes to talk to me about gardening since I have a couple planters outside the front door and his dad used to have a greenhouse. I haven't heard it, but apparently he yells at himself in his place. I can't really judge him for that because I do the same thing myself sometimes. So yeah, not really creepy, but it's definitely eventful. In Chicago, I lived in a small complex with three apartments on each side, split up by a stairwell. I lived on the third floor and have a few stories about messed up neighbors. I was in my late teens in beauty school and my two best friends who I lived with were in college so naturally, we had parties, came home late, etc. We lived in Lakeview, which is a pretty loud and young neighborhood in Chicago, not to mention we lived in between a bar and a Mexican restaurant that had a full mariachi band a couple of nights a week, so it was never quiet. So our downstairs neighbor was this super mean old lady who'd always complain about us with passive-aggressive notes, which she'd always say us to make it seem like she lived with someone else besides her cat. She was super standoffish because we'd always offer to hold the door for her if we went into our building at the same time or say hi in passing while taking out our trash down the stairs we all shared going down to our back porches, and she'd always just straight up ignore us or say something mean. So we had an exposed brick wall that ran up all three apartments which looked cool but was awful for us because she took dumpster plywood and boarded up the entire thing, which led to a disgusting, almost two year centipede infestation. She also put newspaper over all her windows. I felt bad for her because she was clearly alone, and I'm sure we were annoying as heck young adults, but it was a neighborhood meant for young people, and all attempts at kindness were rejected. So we started to notice one day that the hallway smelled weird, and after a week it started smelling pretty bad. There was a super nice older couple that lived across from her that would check on her occasionally, so I think they were the ones who called the cops she died, which started to smell, and her cat started to eat her due to lack of food. After they cleared out the body and removed all the plywood off the brick wall, we no longer had a centipede problem. I feel really bad for the poor lady because she died alone and angry. Second story. One Halloween, my roommate and I went out to a party close to our apartment, and our other roommate was going to stop at home, then meet us there when she got off work. So when she got home, she saw a young kid, maybe about eight, nine, with blood splattered on his clothes. She thought it was a Halloween thing until he started crying and screaming, then heard the couple on the first floor screaming and fighting, so she called the cops, and apparently the girlfriend stabbed the husband which sprayed blood on the kid. The dude lived but still. Chicago is a crazy place, even in the nice burbs. So my boyfriend and I had just signed for our current apartment, we walked around the block and we came across this house that is right behind our building. The front yard is covered in junk, like everything political signs and religious signs and random gnomes. They have a shrunken head type thing on a stick. It was early October, but I don't think it was a Halloween decoration. You literally cannot see the ground, it's all just stuff everywhere and completely overgrown. There is a giant cross and Bible verse painted on the side of the house. There is an impossibly beat up, rusty old car parked in front. He has a Trump flag hanging on his porch, which is super tattered. So when we moved in, we discovered we can see their backyard from my window. It's worse. There are open umbrellas covered in holes lying around, ladders leading to nowhere, hunks of appliances and chairs just strewn about and at least two big German Shepherd dogs that are kept outside and never brought in. They bark constantly. I don't know how people haven't called the cops and filed noise complaints. They literally bark all day every day, I am not exaggerating. 
One day my boyfriend goes outside to our little balcony on the fire escape and I'm still inside. Suddenly he opens the door and whisper screams babe. Babe come here quick. So I run outside thinking it's like a cute animal or something. But no. It's the neighbor and it's the first time we've seen him after a month of living there. He was sitting on a giant bike thing. But it had three wheels like a tricycle. He was in the middle of the street. Just sitting there. He had some sort of religious sign taped to the back of his bike tricycle, and he also had a license plate mounted to it. He was just this old dude with a big belly, long white hair, and a long white beard. He was wearing a helmet and just sitting there in the middle of the damn road. He wasn't moving. He wasn't even looking around. And we just stood there and watched him like what the F is he doing? We probably watched him sit there for a good ten minutes. Then, ever so slowly, he turns his bike or trike and starts pedaling back toward his house. We lose sight of him when he goes behind some trees. My boyfriend joked that he was a wizard and was trying to apparate, but I just found him really creepy and unsettling. I haven't seen him since, and if I ever have to walk past his house, I cross the road to give myself a wide berth. Growing up, it was my best friend's parents. He lived down the hill from us, the parents, sometimes the grandparents and three boys. And at various times, cousins and other family members, eventually the boys' wives, girlfriends of the boys also would live there on and off. I was down there often for games D&D, &D, HeroQuest and console, movies and our local karate club. When we're old enough, I would hang out at the diner where my friend work and then do whatever. Then head home, typically his place and chill there with his girlfriend or with mine if we were dating at the time. That's all cool. The issue is that HSI family was strung tightly and were heavily armed. They loved me if I had called down that someone was breaking into my house. I am confident that every single person in their house would be armed and running to save my ass in 30 seconds flat. We would be playing PS or whatever and my friend would drop the controller and say, you hear that? Yeah, it was a neighbor getting home. By the time I would get that out, he would have a shotgun and be by the door. It was always a neighbor. They had guns everywhere. I had more guns pulled on me than I care to remember. Were they loaded? Probably. But it was always a joke. Ha ha. The kicker was when we were 18 or 19, my friend, his girlfriend, and me came back to his house. Maybe two in the morning. I would say typical for us. Come into the living room, then into the... Other living room, I guess maybe sitting room, and the father comes barreling downstairs in a rage. Screaming ensues, continues. You're late, your mom. I was worried. Eventually, and this is the part I remember clearly, I almost shot you. I would have killed my own son. Then because I love Oyu so much, I would have had to shoot myself. How could you do this to me? His mom steps up. I am thinking she will breathe some rationality into this situation. I was wrong. Her contribution. Yeah, then after watching my husband kill my baby son and then himself, I would kill myself right here too. Again, this is screamed. So me and his girlfriend look at each other. And just leave. So many, many other issues. One cousin was turning tricks, I think. Offered me sexual favors for cigarettes. She was like 14 or 15. People were constantly married and divorced. I often didn't know who was who. The father was arrested for sitting on a gun while stalking a guy who was maybe stalking his daughter-in-law, I think. It was confusing at the time, too. For all that, loved hanging out there. Probably not the smartest idea. I have a neighbor that lives adjacent from me. We share the same alleyway where garbage and waste is temporarily stored. Anyways, the owner of the house is unknown since our family moved in in 2006. Visitors who are in their 20s to maybe 50s constantly enter the house and exit, and it can get shady at times. So cars are really parked on the driveway since the oldest son's moved out. If there is a car is a shitbox Toyota or something. I always avoided putting anything on their lawn as my younger sister was playing on it, and an old woman threatened to hurt her. The lawn is unkempt and full of weeds and dry grass. Not entirely creepy, but many questions are yet to be answered. I 
I have a really douche or sketchy neighbor who would smoke a cigarette outside his house almost every day. One day, my brother and my Mexican foreign exchange student were playing soccer in our backyard, and the ball went over the fence. Apparently, he wasn't happy about this whatsoever, and so he grabbed his golf club and threatened to hit them with it. From what I can recall, they went inside crying and let me tell you, my mom was pissed. I've never seen anyone get that angry in my life, even to this day. I was driving along one night near my house in Hunts Point and stopped at a stoplight. Yay, I know, bad idea, blah blah blah. Needless to say, what happened next boggled me. Some black dude my neighbor came up to my car and knocked on the window. He told me his friend was in the alley and injured. So, being a good Samaritan and all, I got out of my car and into the alley. Suddenly, he whispered not to move in my ear, so I tried to move and then felt the dull side of the blade against my throat, so I just did what he wanted. As he finished his deed, he looked into my eyes and said, You owe me tree fitty. It was about that time I noticed this dude was about 500 feet tall and from the Paleolithic era. Knowing about this phenomena from the internet, I yelled, God damn it, Loch Ness Monster, I ain't gonna give you no tree fitty. He then swam away as I pulled a gun out of my car and shot at him. When my sister and I were about five and six, we lived in a small town community about 600 people, and we would frequently play outside without parental supervision. Our neighbor would, unbeknownst to our mother, take us to the local ice cream shop for ice cream. One day we moved without explanation. Years later it was told to us that that neighbor was a registered S offender and PDF and mom moved for our safety. She freaked out when she learned about our trips to the ice cream shop. To my knowledge neither me or my sister were ever assaulted, but it is still very scary to think about. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.